Hello. What I thought I'd try and do today is, is respond to some of the questions that people have raised either in their comments or in their responses to the readings. And so what I'll try and do to the degree that we can over the next few weeks is periodically record a lecture that responds to that. And I realized that was not part of how I originally identified in the syllabus, but let's use this experience over the next what now is five weeks as a learning experience and please give me feedback in terms of what's helpful. I will continue to try and respond to most of your comments on first class um, and so you'll have that written response but I thought a few, few of the questions posed particularly kind of interesting um, issues that I thought would be most readily addressed by me in terms of just kind of talking back to you. Um, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to try and answer everybody's or most of everybody's question, but there were a few that, that stood out. And one was, uh, there was one question about disability law and the issue of direct threat. Um, I didn't quite understand that. And so I went back and I double checked. And I would encourage you when you do find areas that you don't understand, just put, put it into your Google search or Yahoo search, whatever, and see what you come up with. But really, basically what the direct threat is. It's the protection of the, or assumed protection of the employer in the event that they hire or are thinking about hiring somebody whose behaviors or illnesses or whatever may pose problems for other people in the employment or other people, customers. Um, and there were two or three, the, the, the factors to be considered include the duration of the risk of that the employee or potential employee would raise, the nature of the severity of the potential harm, the likelihood that the potential harm will occur, and the eminence of the potential harm. Um, what they're talking about there is that if I hire somebody, if I'm an employer and I hire somebody um, whose behaviors are such that I, they, uh, I can't predict them and they somehow then cause harm to another employee or a customer, then I, as the employer, am at risk. And so there's a certain kind of protection. An example here might also be, say if I hired somebody who had a um, an illness, that w and I knew that the person had an illness, and that that illness would put other people at risk, say tuberculosis or those other kinds of things. So somehow, if I put that person in a position of having contact with other people out there, that it could be construed as if I was putting the customers or other employees at risk. And so the law, in terms of the ADA, provides protection to the employer in terms of direct threat. So my interpretation that this potential employee would provide a direct threat to others. Examples of this have been in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of rehabilitation. And this was the first arose with the Rehabilitation Act involved a teacher who was infected with tuberculosis. And this was a Supreme Court decision in 1987. And the Supreme Court, the school district, wanted to remove the class from the classroom because it feared that the children would be infected. Well, ultimately, that the court found that she did not pose a direct threat and could not be excluded from the workplace. However, the court stated forcefully that if she became infectious to other people, so if so during that point in time she was not infected, but if she did become infectious, she would pose a direct threat and could be have been excluded from the workplace. So it depends upon the degree or state of the illness. The second case, uh, also decided by the Supreme Court, involved um, an individual who had a diagnosis of HIV and the uh, dentist said that he didn't have or she didn't have the protections in their office to be able to protect the other employees, but they would still provide the dental service in a hospital. The person and the individual appealed this decision and filed suit. And again, the issue for the for the uh, dentist was that since she she or he didn't have the ability to protect other um, workers from the potential exposure to the HIV virus, that was a direct threat, and the court ruled again in this favor. Um, the case was remanded for jury in the time, you know, because it's really not sure how that's going to get, but the patient refused, sued, alleging that the dental dentist violated the ADA, um, but the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that he should be allowed to present evidence that HIV posed a threat to him and others, and unless he did the procedure uh, for at the hospital. So it is really a case of the direct threat. 
um, is do I hire somebody who's then going to put other workers at jail? Um, one of the questions that, that also was asked in terms of the ADA in terms of is, is are we talking about an unfunded mandate? Not really. I mean, I think that the ADA principally responds to the obligations of the private sector and saying these are the things that you must do or you should do um, to make your setting, your place of work, uh, where you sell goods, those other kinds of entities where, where the community can go and play on the playground, um, that they're not um, discriminatory in some way. Then, so it's, it's not necessarily an unfunded mandate, but it's to begin saying this is what you should do. Of course, the out, and one of the things that several people mentioned was the issue that reasonable accommodation, there could be multiple interpretations, and that each person could have a reasonable accommodation. So what's, what's reasonable for me may, may not be reasonable for somebody else. The other thing is the issue in terms of undue financial hardship. If I, as an employer, or I, as a community, say this, making this change, making our facility more accessible is going to somehow put me at risk of going out of business or we don't have the funds, that's undue financial hardship. And so that provides some kind of protection, as it were, in terms of my having to, to, to make that benefit if I somehow say I'm going I'm to go out of business. Um, I think that um, one of the issues ultimately that this boils down to are the thing thinking and it will address this issue over the next couple of weeks in terms of the ethics, in terms of social justice, how we conceive of our communities, how we conceive of who should participate, what kind of services should we pay for, what kind of services do we think are beyond the bounds, when and if we make decisions to um, um, hire or pay for uh, fire people or police, is that a reasonable expense of a community, but not making a building accessible an unreasonable expense? I think these are larger issues in terms of how we think about individuals. And I think a couple of people raised issues with the question about what happens when we have specialized laws for specific categories of individuals. Clearly one of the issues is, is the dilemma that we face in terms of people currently being discriminated against and how do we remedy that? How do we make sure that people can get into the voting booth? How do we make sure that people can go to the sports event? How do we make sure the kids can play on the playground? How do we make sure the kids can go to school? All those other kinds of things that we see as community events. How do we do that and then somehow not inadvertently serve to segregate or create a separate class or category of people in terms of the long term? Clearly, we one of the questions that comes into the discussion of where, what's the extent of the, of the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, who's protected, who's not protected, and what are the implications if we have to have a special law for a category of people, and how do we do that, and does not that potentially, potentially run the risk of maintaining that special category as a segregated group. Again, we're, we go back to the ethical issue of what do you do for the immediate harm, the immediate discrimination now, and how do we respond to that now but plan for the longer term community, plan for how we envision our society to be more, a more inclusive society in which these kinds of things that, that the ADA uh, needs to address are just taken as given, that we no longer worry about access to the schools, that we no longer worry about being able to get in and out of a sports arena, that we no longer worry about being able to vote, that those are just things that we take for granted, that we no longer worry about whether I can go to an employer and apply for a job and not be discriminated against because of assumptions that the employer may make. Um, I think that one of the other things that um, this issue faces overall for us is how we think about community and how we think about who should be members of, the, of our community, what, do, what are our financial obligations, what are our moral obligations, what are our ethical obligations. And we'll be discussing that over the course of the next four to five weeks Clearly, this coming week, we're going to be looking at specifically ways of analyzing disability policy and disability law. And next week, we'll couple that with um, some readings around ethics and how that builds into some of the assumptions and determinations that we make. Well, I'm going to stop at this point. We'll get this posted and then look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so very much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.